thanks for coming. We only compete with a talk that is given by the CTO, um, sorry, the, the field CTO of Confluent, another talk that is given by Netflix and breakfast. <laughs> so I think everyone who's here is really, really interested in, in the topic. That was, uh, I wanted to show you some streaming data. Now it's stopped moving. Um, cool. So thanks for being here. Um, and let's talk about streaming data and the lake house. I'm Frank, I work for Databricks, which is the data analytics and, and AI company. I'm based in Munich, Germany, uh, where the Oktoberfest is uh, just finished. Uh, finished Monday, and I took the plane on Monday. So really love being here. Um, the slides will be on, um, on speaker deck, so you don't need to take photos, and we're happy to share them anyway. Um, let's start according to the time, like the 8 a.m. question. I guess you're all working with Apache Spark. Do you remember what is the most impressive feature of Apache Spark, like when you started, or like what you encountered the, the last uh, years when you were working with the product? I, I remember this. When, when I started, I mean, obviously, I have a background, and I spend a whole lot of time, you know, ingesting data with weird convoluted um, Perl scripts and, and even worse technology. And when I saw this, that you could just do something like spark.readjson, and you ingest any number of files with any number of JSON records, and then you have this data frame API, and you kind of drill down to from your customers who's driving a particular car, I thought like, wow, this is so good. You know, it takes away all the complicated things and it gives me a level that I like to work on because obviously, I mean, I have this background. I, can't, I could do it otherwise in other ways, but I don't want to invest my time in this. And when I then realized I could do the same thing in SQL and you can just flip backwards and forwards between SQL and Python um, or Perl and, and write the same statement, I thought like, wow, this is great. I'm not so much an SQL person, more, more a developer person, but sometimes I feel like, wow, that's just a better way of doing it. And having this capability is amazing. I still remember how I saw, how, I, how I've um, experienced this, this the first time. A lot of people forget what is really happening um, behind the curtain. And this is all this, you know, parallelization um, that is happening, like it goes through a logical optimizer and a physical optimizer, and then even at runtime, it, it gets rebalanced. And what you write as like a, as, a, as normal code is executed in parallel. And this is where we get to scale, you know, like this is how it all started, how we kind of um, uh, had better technology, like the old database vendors that had physical limitations for scale, but then also financial limitations because you just couldn't afford it any longer to add another instance to your old school database or data warehouse. And uh, with Spark, we, we just scale it. It works on spot instances on, on the cloud and it's, it's fantastic and it's cheap and it scales. The last thing is, I did a Kafka uh, tutorial like, feels like not that long ago, but counting the pandemic uh, years, it was like maybe five years ago. And I don't know, but it gets a lot of hits and like every two to three weeks, somebody's texting me a message and says, hey Frank, that's an amazing tutorial, but can you teach me how to write a client for Kafka in Python or in Java? They always have some requirement. I would think like, well, the clients today that I think of, they go like spark.readstream.formatkafka. And that's it, you know, it's one single line and sometimes I'm, I'm telling people this and say, look, it's like reading a file where you would say spark.read JSON file, and it just instead of read JSON, we say read stream, and then we read from Kafka, and that's it, it's fantastic. And this is the entry into the streaming world from um, Apache Kafka, and that's all open source, everyone um, can use it, and I think it's amazing technology, and obviously it doesn't only work with Kafka, you can replace Kafka with Kinesis or Socket Stream, um, whatever. Cool. So the whole world of stream processing is kind of interesting because we go away from the batch where we kind of have data, we kind of accumulate data in a storage system, and then we create this artificial boundary, and then we process it all at once. The streaming way of doing it is like processing 
um, what shows up. So it's continuous data, it's unbounded data, and quite often it comes with a requirement of being processed in a timely manner. And this obviously has a lot of technical advantages. Just the first one is we give up this artificial boundary that we create for batch processing. So it's not a two-step process, it's a continuous flow. Um, because we process smaller amount of data, we, small amount of data, we get to smaller latency as well, which is good for time-sensitive applications if you need like a business outcome quicker. And the other thing is that after the processing step, there is a checkpointing step. And if you process small amounts of data, you checkpoint more often. And if you need to roll back, maybe because it's running on a spot instance, and the spot instance is taking away because the bid price goes up or down, it's easier for recovery and fault tolerance. And the last thing is easy to imagine. If you have a big chunk of data that you process once a month, how does your CPU curve look like? Well, end of the month it goes up like this and then it's all the processing and then it goes down. And how would you cater for that? It's pretty difficult on-prem, it's easier um, in the cloud. But anyway, it's better compute utilization if you do it in a streaming way. All right, and then there's a couple of misconceptions and I just quickly want to mention them because we, we, we see them um, all the time. The first one is that stream processing is only for low latency use cases, and that's not true. You can deal with a use case with higher latency in a stream processing way. And actually, you can, if you think it to the end, it's like batch is more a special case of streaming. And the other one is, I sometimes like to call this, it's like the cap theorem of, of streaming data. Do you know what the cap theorem is? That's what everyone learns in university, and then we tend to forget it. And then if you want to apply for a job at Google, people relearn that because they think they're getting asked this. So the cap theorem is like, I have a shoemaker next to my place where I live in Germany, and he has a sign, and the sign says, I know you want it cheap, and you want it quick, and you want uh, good quality. Pick two of those and let me know. And it's the same thing here with latency, cost, and accuracy. We tend to believe, I don't know why, because probably we read it all the time from you know, marketing people and whoever, that lower latency is better, but that's not true. If you reduce the latency, you typically increase the cost because you have more compute going on, you know, like trying to, um, to process the things um, um, quickly, and the accuracy goes down as well. Why, if you do stream processing, um, typically we have timed windows, and if you have very short timed windows, like a second or a split second, um, you might lose data that is not arriving in the split second that arrives late, but you can't deal with this data anymore because it's just showing up late. So lower latency is not always better. Um, what is good is if you, have, if you have the possibility to choose the right amount of latency and optimize for that. Very often we have systems in business that are optimized for throughput and not for latency. But then we had this amazing talk from Karthik yesterday speaking about how we can reduce latency in stream processing. So it's more about the programming um, paradigm than like you know, chasing after latency. And uh, this brings us to Spark Structured Streaming. I think you all know it's the um, scalable fault tolerant um, streaming engine um, on top of Spark. And yesterday we had this talk about how we can use Project Lightspeed to get to predictable and low latencies uh, with uh, Spark Structured Streaming. What we do is typically three things. There is a source um, where we read like initial um, data and we have to keep track of, of an offset because you need to remember like what data is read or, already. Then there is this transformation step, doing transformations, you know, like replacing um, column names and uh, replacing um, types. And then we have the sync where we write um, the data into another system or into a table. And once the data is written, there has to be a checkpoint written as well. And then there is a trigger that triggers the whole thing. And if you look at this from a code perspective, it's the same thing. There is a source, read stream from format Kafka. Then there is this transformation. It could be a select statement. There is the sync, write stream, 
And then we have some kind of configuration, like how often is this executing? And here it's like a fixed timed interval of uh, 30 seconds, and then you need to provide a checkpoint location, a directory where this checkpoint is written. So it comes with a lot of benefits. I think the biggest one is this uh, unified batch and streaming approach that I like a lot. I told you it's not so much about latency typically, although now we look into latency with Project Lightspeed. It's more optimized for throughput and cost because that's the, what most businesses want. And then we get this exactly one semantics that's very important. So we have this kind of assurance that things are not happening twice. And the last one is a rich ecosystem of connectors and I'm coming back to this. Okay, now the title of the talk is about the data lakehouse and streaming data. And probably a lot of people here say, so what's the data lakehouse at all? Like why data lakehouse? And how does it work with streaming data? Now, I think it's easiest to start with this data maturity curve. Um, there's a lot of companies out there who are super successful with data and AI. And do you know how, how you able to, to tell that a company is like very successful? If the company name turns into a verb, like, you know, before I flew to Texas, I was Googling a lot about barbecue in Texas. This morning, I thought, like, it's still too dark. Um, I won't um, tweet a picture from my hotel room, you know, but I'm tweeting later. Um, then there's no time to Netflix here because it's a business trip. Um, so we use those company names as verbs. And those companies are so successful, we use them as verbs. And they are so successful because they're so good with their usage of data and AI. For some other companies, it's a big struggle to get to this right end of this data maturity curve. And it is a struggle, first of all, because AI is not easy. And the struggle is also because you can't give up the left side. If you tell your CIO, CTO, CEO, whoever, you're gonna shut down the data warehouse, they will be very unhappy. They need something that the data warehouse is doing. They need the data that this data warehouse is producing. So they all want to move to the right-hand side. Um, and the complexity is that you have two different data management platforms, two different systems. It starts with the different workloads, like the classical data warehouse workload is business intelligence and SQL analytics. Whereas what we do on data lakes is more data science, machine learning, well, all the cool forward-looking AI stuff. Whereas the data warehouse is more the backward-looking, you know, like what happened um, last month. If you look at this from a governance layer, it's completely different things, you know. On the left-hand side, you need, to, you need to deal with tables. On the right-hand side, we have files or objects in, in buckets. It's not the same thing. And on the lowest level, um, it's getting, for a tech person like me, it's getting more interesting. People start to copy data over from the left to the right and from the right to the left. Now, they copy from the right to the left because they have data in the data lake, but they want to do the business intelligence and the SQL analytics. So it goes from right to left. And then I always said, like, people copy from the data warehouse into the data lake to run ML. And then I had a fireside chat um, with colleagues, ex-colleagues from AWS, and I said, like, the data scientist of, of that group, I said, hey, is it really true? Like, do you sometimes use a data warehouse to run ML workloads? Is this happening? And they said, yeah, you know, we have Redshift. I said the word, they have Redshift. I said, but you use it for ML. And they say, well, we often have data in Redshift, but then to make it usable, we put it in a S3 bucket, so they go to the data lake site. That means you copy from right to left, left to right. You have two copies, the data is stale, and you pay for twice the storage. And that's not what you want. So the solution that is getting more and more popular, and it's a platform, it's an architectural style that um, Databricks um, championed, is called Lakehouse. It is simple because it unifies both stacks. And this is what I want to explain a little bit in more detail. It is open because it's based on open source and open standards, super important, and you're gonna see this as well. And it's multi-cloud. Um, so very often um, when I do a demo, I tell people, now tell me where the demo is running. Is it Azure or GCP or AWS? 
And people can't tell me because it's the same thing on all three clouds. And then there's other components that are really important, like the Unity catalog for governance, which is not the big topic here in this uh, talk. Right. So obviously, if we have this lake house, we want to understand how all those streaming use cases, you know, like um, change data capture for databases or clickstream analysis or any kind of streaming use case can be well, processed on the data lake house. And that's the goal of this um, presentation. Right. So first of all, I see it in your faces. You may be not convinced and say, like, how does this work, like, you know, just combining two separate data management stacks? Is this really a thing? Or is it just, you know, just people talking about that? It is a thing. It's actually an open source project that gives you the foundation. It's called Delta Lake. Delta Lake is a Linux Foundation um, open source project. And it kind of turns your data lake into the lake house. That means if you think about a data warehouse, you had a lot of qualities that you give up if you move to a data lake. So the thinking like you could replace your expensive data warehouse with a cheap data lake that gives you this, you know, virtually unlimited amount of storage, this um, crazy high, uh, this high availability, crazy high durability, and it's cheap at the same time. It never worked out, you know, because this data lake turned into a data swamp, or sometimes I say like an enterprise, um, yeah, like an enterprise bucket where you drop everything. And Delta Lake brings you this quality back on the data lake. So the, um, it brings a lot of qualities, like um, uh, qualities that you know from your data warehouse, like asset transactions and many more. There is a publication out, um, it's a CI, CIDR um, conference and a journal, which talks about the Delta Lake. And that's actually a good read. And there was a big discussion in, the, in social media um, lately where people talked about this publication and all the tech that is behind there. One of the key names I tell you to remember is Michael Albrust. So he's the first author um, of this publication. He's also the guy who invented Spark Structured Streaming, the creator of Spark Structured Streaming. And he's the one who's working on something which provides you a higher level of abstraction for data pipelines. It's called Delta Life Tables. And I'm going to show you this um, at the end of the presentation. So that's a good name to remember. Um, also to Google for YouTube talks from Data and AI Summit. Um, whatever you find from him, that's kind of the, the, the foundation, the base. It's like reading Che Krabs papers about the early days of Kafka and the Kafka log and how this is applied to make um, Kafka work. There's a rich, um, um, it's a rich um, ecosystem of connectors. Um, it's, as I said, it's, it's like open standards, open technology. If you look at the new ones, there is Flink and Trino and Presto, um, but there's also connectors for Pulsar and um, Google BigQuery and a lot of existing ones. So it's an open ecosystem. That's the important thing. You don't want to be um, locked in. Now, if you say, hey, that's open source, how would I start? I did a lot of demos where I took these slides and then I copy the, the, the code, and basically I run it in a terminal window, and all you do is PySpark minus package delta. And then you have delta lake enabled in a PySpark shell. Now, this is not the talk. Um, it exists on YouTube. But this is how to get started. And then all of a sudden, you can do a lot of things. You can take your data that you were reading with the spark.readjson, your JSON data, and write it in delta format. That's the very first step. It's two lines, it's super easy, you can save it as a table, and then you can run your SQL on that table. Now, if you're not doing this, and maybe you still think like, why would I need that? Remember this abstraction that I told you, like how beautiful it is to ingest any number of JSON files with any number of records and then run an SQL across the files and those records. That's fantastic, I think. Go one step further and this abstraction breaks. If you try and not do an SQL select but an update, it will not work because you know the underlying table format is just not built for that. If you run this on Delta Lake, you can do updates. This is the point that I was trying to explain. It brings you these data warehouse qualities back to your data lake and that kind of enables, kind of turns your data lake into the lake house. 
So you can do updates. You can actually do much, much more than updates. You can do updates, merges. You can do time travel. Uh, you can have like um, updates on tables and then say, well, yesterday before I left at six, I did something that was not good. So I want to go back to the version from yesterday at five o'clock. Or you want to go back to version zero or version 17. And that's all possible. So it works like a real database at the end. You can clone, that's fantastic, I love this. You create a clone, there is deep and shallow clones, um, meaning you copy over the data or not, but um, you can have a clone, experiment with the data, you know, do some, something, do deletes, do absurd, do merges, and then you realize, oh no, that was not so good, and then you just dropped a clone, it was just a clone, you know. All this functionality that we had, that we have in data warehouses, and that we're used to from databases, we now have it on the data lake, on, in the lake house. If you enable your data lake to a lake house, you have all this functionality. There is um, more advanced stuff like, you know, telling the system how to co-locate um, data with a C order. Um, if there is a history capped for, um, for those updates, um, we also want to be able to compact this again to remove um, outdated data. This is the vacuum. So we have all this. And then I still see puzzled faces because people probably now say, well, you show us the syntax. We understand that you now can run these SQL things that make it look more like a data warehouse, but does it really perform like a data warehouse? I mean, that's the other question. People often say, you know, we trust you. You build Spark and Spark Structured Streaming. You're really good with petabyte of data. But how about the data warehouse side? Does it perform? The answer is yes, without going into too many details, I want to give you three, three points. First, the SQL part, it's serverless. There's a serverless endpoint. You can use it to connect your Power BI or your Tableau um, dashboards to it. There is no startup time um, for clusters, so um, all this goes away. There is no administrative overhead you know, to define those clusters. It's lower TCO, it's, it's actually, a bit like, I was doing a lot of Java, and when we had this JDBC and the JDBC database connectors, I always told the database people, look, this is exactly the abstraction that I like, like, like to see. I want to have one URL pointing to the database, and don't give me all these database details. I want this URL, and please make the rest work in an efficient way. And this is kind of the same thing, but even serverless. If you look at the... Um, performance, and what you see in this diagram is a very old version of the Databricks runtime, which is normalized to one. So Databricks version, the version two is normalized to a value of one. And then you see the increment that we've seen over time. So we were constantly working um, to improve the throughput, um, and the higher is better. And then you see the last well, the last step is like a huge jump. And it's the jump that we get from version eight to going to Photon. Photon is an extra development. We kind of re-implemented um, a lot of what Spark was doing in a vectorized C++ execution engine that takes, well, benefit that uses the new CPU architectures um, that we see out there. And it kind of speeds up things a lot. And you see this, this huge gap. Now, the last thing is it's still talking, 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 but can you prove it? Yeah, we were running this, um, this TPC-DS benchmark, and this is a benchmark that uses files with a size of 100 terabyte, so like really huge files. Remember when I told you about latencies and throughput? This is big files, this is about throughput, you know, and it, it worked. So there is a, um, we set a new, uh, new, rec new record for the benchmark. It was like three times faster, and if you're not only looking at performance, it's not three times faster. If you're looking at price performance, it's like 12 times better. And that's an official um, benchmark run by the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So that's like, it is performant. That's the short version. And now, back to streaming. Now, we want to talk about streaming. I told you about how we have this Delta Lake, how it gives you all this data warehouse, database qualities. But how about streaming? Well, streaming is just built in, you know. This is a um, Spark um, streaming, um, uh, streaming analytics um, um, line of code. So what I do here 
I read from a Delta Lake table. It's a Delta Lake table that is actually created by a streaming data pipeline. So it's continuously updated. Um, and I read from that. So the thing is, a Delta table can be a streaming source. I can read from this, and this is exactly uh, what, is, what is happening here with this uh, read stream. And I can write to a Delta table in a streaming way. So there's no extra streaming system. It's just built into Delta. And the other thing that you can see here is like if a streaming system is always updated, if you like read from a queue or read from a streaming table, you have to have other mechanisms. You need to be able to deal with the streaming data to do streaming data analytics. And this is what can be done with the Spark structured streaming. So if everything changes all the time, the only thing that is kind of fixed is if you say what happened on average in the last 10 minutes. And um, I'm gonna show you a demo about a system where we kind of measure heart rates. And the question here is how did the heart rates for a, a sliding window of one minute length change over time? And you see this curve. And I'm gonna explain you why this curve is kind of uh, important. Right, now, no talk without a good quote. Mr. Hope is always good for a quote. He actually used to work for a while in Germany. He spent years working at Google. I think now he's, uh, he's Amazon. And he says, well, build abstractions, not illusions. So, so far it was PowerPoint. It was hopefully not illusions. I was trying to motivate the tech. But what you really need um, as a practitioner are abstractions that are useful. Now, how? Does this apply to the lake house when I told you, you know, it's all about simplification. It's about putting two data stacks, merging them into one, like having one simple stack that just does the work that you need to do. So how does this apply for streaming ingestion and streaming data pipelines? And there's a lot to talk about. I will narrow, I want to focus on two things. The first one is autoloader. Now, autoloader, explained in, in, in a simple way is ingestion as easy as dropping a file in a folder or as, you know, dropping a, uh, an object into an S3 bucket. And then autoloader picks it up, it loads it exactly once, it infers the schema, it enforces the schema, and then you can use it. Autoloader itself is a streaming data source. So if you create a streaming data pipeline, the very practical way of starting such a streaming data pipeline is with autoloader because it's a streaming data source. This is the, um, the Python um, syntax. Come, come back to this. And we use it. We use it a lot. We use it like for five petabytes per day uh, ingestion at, at Databricks. And the second thing, and I want to show you this in a, in a live demo as well, is data pipelines. And the product is the managed service. It's called Delta Life Tables. The interesting thing with Delta Life Tables is we can create a data pipeline by purely writing SQL statements. So it's SQL. Um, if you look at this, this second and third line, that's actually autoloader. It's loading files from this slash raw data, JSON files, and it's using them in a streaming way for the streaming data pipeline. If I challenge you and say, how would you specify such an ingestion step in, you know, in pseudocode code that doesn't have to be executed, that just explains what it's doing, I would probably write something like this third line. But the difference here is it's real code. It's running. Now, I was showing this to a group of people, and most of them we hired from AWS. And they said, yeah, Frank, but you're not telling us the difficult things. You know, To make this work efficiently on S3, you probably need to capture the events that you get from S3 if you add a new file to an S3 bucket. And then you have to have like SNS for the notifications from these events and SQS to put the file into a queue to read it exactly once. And all this is really difficult and you need to have IAM rules. And I said, well, I'm not telling you about this because I never do this. This is what I get if I use autoloader. I write this one line and all this you know, complicated technical things that happen behind the curtain, they just happen. And then often I have this discussion about, yeah, but how about this multi-cloud, you know? Is it really a thing? I say, look at this single line again. This is, guess what? Is it AWS? Is it GCP? Is it 
I'm Azure. It's multi-cloud. It works anywhere. You know, all this complicated heavy lifting is done for you, and this is the way to ingest. Then Delta Life Tables is the way to create um, streaming data pipelines. Interesting thing is we can create them in SQL only. If you want, you can switch to Python if you feel more comfortable with Python. Um, I'm going to show you a bit of code um, for both. Um, the way it works is it kind of starts with one table, which is this raw table. And we create a streaming raw table. It means it's a streaming table. A streaming table in DLT means it remembers state. It knows what data is read already. And if you run the pipeline again, in the next, when the pipeline is triggered again, it will only read the new data. The second table here, it's called clean data, is based on this raw data. So it's always a concatenation of first table, second table, third table, and of course it could branch out, it could be more complicated like a DHE. But you have these dependencies and it's like the CTAS, create table S select, CTAS, yeah, CTAS, create table S select pattern that you will see all the time. The other thing is it's scaling automatically. You don't want to scale this yourself because to scale this yourself you had to measure and monitor what the system is doing all the time. And then you have to react on what the system is doing. And you know, the way I explain it, it already tells you this is better done by a machine. So we have auto scaling. We're currently um, working on um, an advanced auto scaling um, that is um, uh, going uh, GA soon. Right. So there is a 10K view that I briefly, briefly want to show you just to connect some dots. And it starts with what I was telling you. Remember, we have files and we want to ingest them. And this is where we can use Databricks autoloader. That's, I told you, it's as easy as dropping those files in a folder. I showed you the line of code that autoloader is doing. Then to, to have a data pipeline, you can go to Delta Life Tables, which is an abstraction on top of Spark Structured Streaming, which gives you this SQL abstraction where you just declare what you want to do but you don't tell the system how to do it. The system is figuring um, this out for you automatically. If you wanted, you could go to Spark Structured Streaming, lower level of abstraction. Remember, Gregor Hope, build abstractions, not illusions. That's a really cool abstraction, the Delta Life Table. Auto Loader is another one. Now, this is Kafka Summit. Well, it's not Kafka Summit anymore. This is current, but you still talk about Kafka. So we want to know how can we ingest data from messaging systems, Kafka, Kinesis, um, and all the, um, the other services that implement um, the same protocol. And the answer is we can still use Delta Life Tables, and this time we would go to Python, and it's much more the Spark Structured Streaming syntax. This is what I want to show you. So this actually was my live data. That was the joke when I wanted to start, and I'm not sure what happened here. Ah, it's still moving. Okay, so that's the second demo that I want to show you. Um, streaming data. This is not just a printout. This is actually coming out of a Kafka queue. Let me stop this. Um, this is Kafka Cat, my favorite tool to read from a Kafka queue. And you see this is producing all this data. I come back to this data um, in a second. The first thing that I wanted to show you is here. Um, so I built a demo at Data and AI Summit that I was showing live in San Francisco where we were collecting tweets, like a Twitter stream. We were collecting tweets based on a search criteria, so everything that matched to Data and AI Summit, everything that matched to Delta Life Tables, everything that matched to data pipelines. And this is the first step of the demo, like again, this is just a comment, let me remove that. And then this is the first step, and this is again to kind of appreciate how cool autoloader it is. So my demo was writing the tweets into an S3 bucket, which is the, you know, the data lake kind of thing without a schema, with a lot of um, dirty data. So it's ingested here as JSON files. We create the first table, which is this bronze table. It's all done in SQL. When I run it, it will auto scale. And I need like two or three lines, depending on what kind of syntax you prefer. 
And then the second table, the silver table, is based on, oops, sorry about that. It's based on this brass table. Silver is created from the brass table. And then a couple of things happen. The Twitter stream has 40 different columns. I don't know these columns. I don't know the attribute names. I don't know the attribute types. All the mapping happens here in Autoloader. It's doing the schema inf inference, the schema detection. So that's cool because I don't want to map those 40 plus types. Now, from those 40 different columns for the classification of my tweets, I want to classify them with a little bit of ML. I only want to have this language and the text. The language I need because the, the Twitter application is picking up tweets in English, in German, in Spanish, and the machine learning model, as in real life, unfortunately, it's only trained for English tweets. It cannot classify a German tweet into positive or negative. So here, I drop columns from the 40 columns, I take over four, and then I have this language thing. Like the language, which is not English, doesn't make any sense. In DLT, what we have is we have expectations. It's a SQL constraint, and it says, well, if the language is not English, then on violation, um, drop the row. So I'm dropping rows and I'm dropping columns. I'm cleaning up the data for machine learning. And let me see. In the end, this was the result. So this was taking the data coming from the DLT pipeline which is a delta table again, and feeding it into a hacking face transformer, and then looking for the most popular keywords. And you see it works with Data and AI Summit, we get rocks, we get DLT, data breaks, audience, amazing, learn, talk. So this is as cool as it gets. That was a super cool demo. Um, it's live on our demo hub. If you get the slides, you get a link to demo hub as well. This is why I was not showing it here. What I wanted to show you here, I have seven minutes left, that's just the right amount of time, is this. This data is a simulation. Like, um, do you remember when the pandemic started? When the pandemic started, there was a project in Germany where the a scientific group said, um, look, if we could measure the fever curves in the population of the German people, and if the fever goes up, at this time it's most likely linked to a corona outbreak. And that was the very beginning, remember? It was not like the whole country was infected already. It was just patches. It was actually two, um, two areas. One area is where they had the big celebration of carnival. Like, scientists said, don't celebrate, you know, you will catch the virus. They still did it. It's a red area on the map. And the other one is where they went skiing and had after ski parties and came back. And you can clearly tell this other area of the map. This is a later stage when the project already started. The challenge is you can't measure fever in 80 million people. How would you do that? It's just not feasible. And then the scientists said, look, what we can do is we can measure your heart rate. And if the heart rate, if you have a fever, your heart rate goes up. The resting heart rate actually goes up. Now, how do you measure the heart rate? You all walk around with heart rate measurement uh, systems. This is Germany, you just can't intercept the data. You have to ask people to donate the data. So there was a big data donation project. And I said, yeah, you can have my heart rate data, just take it and, and measure it. And um, I built a simulator for the whole thing. So I'm kind of having the data, which is, which is here. And this is kind of data that you could expect. And it's like really dirty, ugly data. You know, it comes with an IP address. And don't try and store a IP address attached to personal device in, in Germany. Um, it comes with a timestamp. It comes with a version um, number. It comes with your tracker model. And then it, it comes with heart rate measurements. But if you carefully look, sometimes this data is not really good. It, it drops some measurements. And it comes with like unnecessary calorie consumption. It's the same story. We need to get rid of certain um, columns, and then we only want to have those rows that make sense where the heart rate you know, is, is kind of a number. It's a digit. It's not zero. How would we do that? And that's the last demo that I want to show you. Okay. 
So I'm generating the events. I already told you it's, um, it's a generator. It's running here in the background. You don't see much. What you see is these are the, the writes to the Kafka queue, and these are the asynchronous replies. This is the partition, and this is the offset. That's how it starts, and I started it like a while ago before I started, before I set up here. So it's creating a lot of events already. It's using Confluent um, Kafka. So always get locked out here. That was actually a very pleasant experience. I did the stupid thing first. I did the same demo, and I tried to install. Well, I, I know how to install Kafka. I've done this many times. But I installed it on EC2 and uh, was running my own self-hosted, self-managed Kafka. I was just so much overhead, and then I changed to Confluent Cloud. And you see I have my, my cluster. I click on the cluster. In the cluster, I have one topic. That's the topic. That's the fitness tracker. This is where all the you know, fitness tracker data is sent to. This is where you saw the output in the, uh, in the data stream. This is bytes per second produced and consumed. So this is actually working beautifully, created by this generator, and then it's picked up here. It's picked up by the data pipeline created by Delta Life Tables, written in Python. It's the data quality is improved step by step, and at the end, the data pipeline, it's creating a Delta table. Remember, it's suitable for streaming to and streaming from, so at the end, I stream to a Delta table, and then I do streaming data analytics to get this curve. One thing I want to point out, because sometimes I forget this, if you think about Kafka, it's not meant for like a database, you know? You don't store data in Kafka forever. The default retention time is seven days. If we talk about delta tables, they're meant for indefinite retention. So, as I told you, remember the data warehouse. We want to keep this data. Now, if you have data here and you want to backfill, you want to completely refresh the system here, there is a way to do it. But imagine what happens if the data expired here already. It's eight days old, the retention is seven days, the data is not there anymore, and you completely refresh the system. Well, it's not a good idea. You will lose data. This is why there is a special setting that says, you know, pipelines reset allowed, true or false. So I can, I can change this. Um, looking at, that's the Python code. Remember the SQL that I was showing you? The equivalent of create live table would be, um, would be this one. DLT table, it's a Python annotation. Forget about the comment. That's actually the property that I just told you, reset allowed or not. So having a single um, method here that says Kafka events creates the first table if I attach this uh, decorator to it. What it does, it returns the raw Kafka events. I told you this is much more like Spark structured streaming. Spark, read stream, Kafka, subscri subscribe. And then we have a lot of this syntactic sugar that we need to correctly authenticate against the Confluent um, cloud, the Kafka broker in the Confluent cloud. And then it goes on. We have the next table. Well, actually, no, this is Kafka, you know. Kafka is binary data. We don't have files where we can infer the schema automatically. So I define the schema. I map the schema here in, um, from JSON cast. This is where I map the schema. I create another table, which is called BPM cleansed, and I returned the stream from BPM raw. So it's again concatenating um, those tables. If it's running, it looks like this. It was running before, and you can tell it ingested 1,800 um, data sets. If I run it again, it's a streaming data pipeline. Remember what I told you about streaming pipelines? They remember the state. So if I run this again, it will not pick up the 1,800 events that it already knows, but it will pick up all the events that happened in between. That was basically the duration of the talk because I triggered this before I, I started talking. And it's running here. Looks exciting. 7,000. Um, one more thing I want to show you, and that's maybe the last thing. If I click on, if I click on this, um, this table, the cleansed table, 
It's only um, 6,000 something. It's not all the 7,000 um, data sets. And a few of them were dropped. Remember, I had um, BPM uh, that didn't exist or they were zero. I have a rule that kind of excludes the zombies. So if someone has no pulse, I don't want to have them here in, the, um, in this, uh, in, in this uh, data pipeline. I drop them here. It's the same story. It's like the SQL constraint. It's an expectation in DLT. We drop the lines that we, we, that we can't want to work with. And then at the end, this is the output. I told you we can read from delta tables. That's the table. It's a proper delta table. That's the database. That's the table name. And then I do the streaming data analytics. Remember, we can only work with Windows because it's changing all the time. So the question is, the average BPM over the last minute, if we sort this over time, it started like here, like a bit before 8. The talk started at 8. Um, and if we look at the average BPM, like should go up if people have a fever and that means a corona outbreak, should you all run and leave the room? Well, it's synthetic data, don't worry, I created it. It's actually meant to go up, so for the show effect. Um, but this is how we connect the dots, you know, from ingesting IoT data, I would say, cleaning up the data, um, ingesting the data from a Kafka queue, um, Kafka topic, sorry, um, cleaning up the data with a Delta Life table pipeline, and then doing streaming data analytics with windowed um, time function, and that's the output. Well, as I told you, I share the slides with you. Uh, where did it go? I have some more links and resources. Both demos are on GitHub. You can just grab them and play with them. Uh, there's a blog article I wrote about ingesting data from Kafka. And there's lots of resources. Um, why we think running Spark on Databricks is cool. Those demos. Um, don't forget the Databricks community. It's a fantastic place to sign up and ask your tech questions. There's training and certification. That's the link to the slides. Um, with this, I want to say thank you. You've been an amazing audience. It was really early, 8 o'clock. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you.